To talk about education is to talk about creation and the Creator. It means speaking of the loving gaze of a father and mother, of life's hopes, of newness, and of the contemplative musings of children who learn to gaze at reality, to name it, to use their freedom and their ability to feel, to exert mastery, to create new possibilities, to affirm themselves as people. God invites us to collaborate with Him. For us, the handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, education has always been a precious apostolic mission in which we have worked with great enthusiasm, sacrifice, and commitment. Education is an expression of our reparative mission, one that is characteristic of our evangelizing action, and one that has marked our apostolic task since the beginnings of the congregation. Centered in our Eucharistic life, the handmaids have always tried to communicate the love of Jesus to the world, and education has seemed to us the most fitting means to accomplish this. How much interest and dedication we have put into schools, catechesis, and the comprehensive formation of children and youth. Moreover, all of our other activities have been closely tied to faith formation and human development. General Congregation Roman 16 recommended to the Superior General that she look for the best means of drawing up a document to express what is most characteristic of our style of education, developing its content from our identity and mission. We receive this recommendation with delight, yet without knowing how to begin it or how to direct it. Many sisters have participated in this work. Sisters Francisca Luss and Pillar Serrano laid the foundation with enthusiasm and dedication, and SR. Teresa Lezeka continued the work with the true passion that characterizes an educator. She was aided by those sisters who work silently in the archives, Maria Westphalen, Edith Torres, and Anna Maria Hernese. At last, we all have the joy of seeing the book finished and offer our thanks to all who have in one way or another collaborated in its composition. I do not exaggerate when I say that the study of our own pedagogy has been a passionate undertaking. Many writings from our early years have come to light, some of which were previously unknown, although reflected in one way or another in later writings. In fact, documents are still appearing. The first handmade educators had great interest in providing a good formation to the girls in our schools and academies and wrote the first norms and rules with the goal of organizing our educational efforts well, as good handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. They had a special concern for the formation of the girls' hearts. The pedagogy of the heart was their way of promoting greater love, and in this spirit, they took inspiration from what they saw in the writings of other congregations with more experience in teaching, the Society of the Sacred Heart and the Company of Mary. All of these sources helped them formulate their own pedagogy, but it was the ratio studium of the Company of Jesus which most strongly left its mark on our educational system as we can see in our oldest directives. All that they read and admired, as well as their own experience in dealing with students, served the handmaids well as they committed to paper what they considered fundamental in education, giving it the seal of our charism. Education, as an expression of reparation, selfless generosity towards poor girls, dedication to developing in our students the desire to help the most needy, solid piety, and love of the blessed mother, there was also something special in the method of education. They transmitted love for the Eucharist and took special care in Eucharistic celebrations with our students. They affirmed that all good things come from the Eucharist. Doubtless, the hours our sisters spent in adoration of Jesus Christ present in the Eucharist were reflected in lived attitudes of love, kindness, and affection in the desire to make Christ known and in their missionary spirit. With the passage of time, our pedagogy has continued to develop. We have sought to respond to what the church and society have needed with openness to new directions and to pedagogical methods better adapted to modern times. We have created updated documents that deal with pedagogy and with the various pastoral activities that take place in our educational institutions, never leaving aside the formation of our students' hearts. The historical documents are so valuable that it seemed appropriate to include them in the appendices with the thought that reading them may help us discover and understand the roots of our pedagogy. In this third millennium, the Catholic school finds itself facing new challenges. Today education is particularly difficult because of the crisis of values in modern society. More than ever, we need creative fidelity, renewed energy, and new initiatives that teach faith in Jesus Christ and love, justice, freedom, and solidarity 
respectful relationships, collaboration and service, care for the weakest, and Christian ethical principles. The world is evolving very quickly, and situations change in just a few years. The church encourages educators to be always willing to be up to date and to educate students for the times in which they live. Our desire is that every student who leaves our educational institutions be able to respond to the question, what is the meaning of life? We read between the lines of the oldest documents of the congregation to discover the desire of handmade educators to give their students the best education possible in the moment or situation in which they found themselves and the sisters' commitment to making themselves apt instruments for this precious task. This desire for the magis in the area of education continues to encourage and energize us even today. May the contact with our roots offered in this book strengthen our desire to allow ourselves to be transformed by the Spirit in order to dedicate ourselves with enthusiasm to the educational mission in the style of St. Raphaela Maria and so many handmaids who have preceded us. Part I, Our Educational History. Chapter 1, Education in the Beginning of the Institute, 1877 to 1903. 1. Education essential to our mission. We must necessarily situate the genesis of our educational activity in the start of the Institute. The beginning of the Institute was not easy for our foundresses. No one chooses the era in which her life story unfolds, but every time period has its unique grace, responsibilities, and limits. The same could be said of the epoch of Raphaela and Pillar. The two sisters reflected and prayed, seeking the path and way of life best suited to respond to the will of God in total availability. Soon they experienced the manifestation of God's will for their lives. In Holy Cross Convent in Cordoba, they had long conversations with Ricardo Miguez and Antonio Ortiz de Urwela, respectively the vicar and archdeacon of the Diocese of Cordoba. The two agreed that society had a great need at that time for religious formation, and they saw in the sisters the ability to respond and offer it. In the first phase of their journey, their time in the Sisters of Mary Reparatrix, we discover this fertile seed of reparative education that, as time went on in the Institute, would go on to germinate and bear abundant fruit. Upon establishing these sisters in Cordoba, the diocese already indicated some conditions. Conditions arrived upon by the vicar, capitular of the diocese of Cordoba Ricardo Miguez, and the Honorable Antonio Ortiz Urwela, who pledged to effect the agreement of said conditions by the Mother General of the Sisters of Mary Reparatrix, for the consolidation of the house established in Cordoba. 1. The scope of the work of the Institute will be broadened, as circumstances permit, so that not only shall it instruct poor girls in Christian doctrine, but it will also provide them with the most complete education possible in everything that a good daughter, wife, and mother should know. 2. A boarding school should also be established, on the premise that it will give not a pretentious education, but rather a broad, solid one, with the goal of attracting the daughters of the important families, thereby instilling morals in this class of society. In October of 1876, some unexpected events among them, the fact that the proposal set forth in the aforementioned document was not fulfilled cause a group of novices of the Society of Marie Reparatrix, including Raffaella Maria and Pillar, to begin construction of a new building. And I can't put into words how my desire for teaching keeps growing, and it even comes to my mind that my sister and I left the Carmelites in order to found a school in Cordoba, and in that we saw, then, the will of God. And it was so clear that when Father Urwela met with the gentlemen who were directing us, and Father pointed out the French sisters, those gentlemen representing us asked that institute for a school. And when they did not fulfill the request, the split happened, at least that was the apparent reason, although there were others. They know that the initiative and its development are the work of the heart of Jesus, and this is enough for them. Here we have had no founder other than the heart of Jesus. The existence of the congregation is due to certain events, and to the Lord who made use of them in order to forge an institute to his liking. They were clear about their specific, personal call from the start, to live and realize this twofold dimension of reparation as collaborators with Christ in him and through him in order to reconcile people among themselves, and with God by means of the worship of adoration of Christ in the Eucharist and the dedication to apostolic activity which was concretized, in a very clear way from the beginning, in educational works. At the time of the separation from the Society of Marie Reparatrix, 
the Archeacon and Cantor of the Cathedral of Cordoba, with the agreement of the two foundresses, drew up the first proposal for the Institute. The foundresses signed an original of this document, directed to the Bishop of the Diocese of Cordoba. In it, we read, We intend to erect a congregation of religious of simple vows who profess a dual life both contemplative and active, the former having as its principal object the perpetual adoration of the sacramental presence of Jesus exposed, and the latter having as its goal the religious and social education of the girls and young women who are placed under their direction, education, which will be totally free for the destitute. None of what has been said excludes other works of charity or beneficence that, according to the times and circumstances, the legitimate superior deems appropriate. Moreover, it is indispensable, in order to avoid instability and to bring about social regeneration, that the minds, hearts, and wills of its members be taught about, develop according to, and be governed in perfect conformity with evangelical precepts and maxims, in all that constitutes Christian education, whose accomplishment is nowhere undertaken with more zeal, more accuracy, and with better fruit than in religious institutes. This document is very important, because from this point forward, education understood in the broad sense will form part of the foundational charism of the Institute. Education will be closely linked to its mission and inclusive of other works that, according to the times and circumstances, it may be appropriate to establish. In successive revisions of the statutes that were being created between 1877 and 1886 for the various official approbations, there appears ever greater specificity in how to carry out education in practice, according to the times. They will also dedicate themselves to teach, free of charge, Christian doctrine to the very poor who go regularly to their schools as day students, and keeping in mind the circumstances of the times, and always with the approval of the ordinary, will be able to receive some boarders in order to instruct and educate them as Christians, without fees beyond that which will be necessary for the costs incurred by the said boarders, who will live, separate from the community, within the grounds of the enclosure. Taking a step forward, we arrive at the year 1886, the year in which the first constitutions were presented to the sacred congregation of bishops and regulars for the pontifical approbation of the Institute. In this writing we find a very clear exposition of the specific mission of the Institute. The importance of apostolic activity remains in place and is now expressed in terms of reparation. The principal end of this Institute is the reparation of the offenses which the Sacred Heart of Jesus receives from people in these calamitous times, not only by way of their ignorance and disdain for the religious worship especially for the Holy Eucharist which is owed to God our Lord, but also through the evil and corrupting instruction which spreads day by day. This congregation takes as means for reparation the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament exposed every day and many nights of the year in its churches, and the free education of its poor day students. Moreover, these constitutions clarify other aspects of the apostolate of education, which we will address later. In the decree of the definitive approbation of the Institute, there is another interesting clarification which highlights one of the aspects already addressed in the document of Father Antonio Ortiz Urwela. Also, they educate destitute girls in religious and civil matters. It is quite obvious that from the very beginning of the Institute education, understood in the broad sense, would form part of the foundational charism and would be closely united to our mission. 2. The needs of society and the church. In Spanish society at the end of the 19th century, there was an urgent call for a comprehensive social reform. In the area of education, two voices were raised, demanding answers and seeking solutions according to various ideologies. In this environment, the first group of handmaids, faithful to their founding charism and full of dynamism, generously offered their whole lives in order to give a concrete response to the needs of society and the church of their time. In the writings of this first period, we have seen how the instruction of girls appears as an objective of the congregation. Our foundresses were aware of the importance of education, and of the many solutions that it could provide in the calamitous times in which they were called to live. In the letter signed by St. Raphaela and addressed to the Papal Secretary of State, expressing some of her wishes, she says, On the occasion of directing myself to your eminence, I do so in the name of the eighteen young women who are my companions. The choir reparatrices, in addition to perpetual adoration, will dedicate themselves to the simple but solid Catholic formation and free instruction of the poor girls of the town. They sense the significance of their mission and express it, 
time and time again when they solicit new foundations from bishops. Let us take, for instance, the example of Cordoba. The number of the religious who make up this congregation having increased, and seeing as the majority are daughters of the city and of the diocese of Cordoba that your most reverend eminence so worthily directs, they desire to found in their own homeland a daughter house of the congregation, canonically established in this city and capital of Madrid, with the goal that the city where it began be the first where the institute expands, in order to give God glory by the fulfillment of its ends, which are the adoration of the blessed sacrament, the free instruction of poor girls, and others which are expressed in the constitutions which accompany this letter. For its content, it is also interesting to read what Mother Sacred Heart writes to the Bishop of Vittoria, Bishop Mariano Miguel Gomez, asking him to permit the foundation of Bilbo, in order to fulfill the ends of the institute. One of the locations where this writer would like to see a new foundation established would be in the capital of Vizcaya, the city of Bilbao, because she believes that there would be, in every respect, an abundant harvest of fruit, especially in the area of free education. For that reason, the superior who writes you, for the accomplishment of the ends here described so necessary in the present times, in which, unfortunately, the offenses against God are multiplied and the lack of religious education is so powerfully felt with the most profound respect to your most illustrious eminence, begs that you grant your authorization and protection for the aforementioned foundation. It is important to note, at the same time, some of the many opinions about education and religious instruction given by different Spanish bishops. The Cardinal Archbishop of Seville, Fr. Seferino Gonzalez, writes, the congregation dedicates itself constantly not only to the adoration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, but also to the instruction and education of poor girls, from which they obtain abundant fruits, which we have seen and praised on more than one occasion, in this and in other dioceses. Finally, the said congregation for these reasons has merited the love and respect of all pious persons. The Bishop of Vitoria, Bishop Mariano Miguel, in his commendation letter, which in Mother Sacred Heart's opinion is one of the most influential because of its length and loving attention, remarks. What is most useful and esteemed in these current calamitous times, said sisters dedicate themselves with tireless care and outstanding fruit to the education of young women in religion and in virtue for which they are held in high regard in all places with unique kindness. These are some of the many favorable testimonies offered by prelates during this time period. Many more could be quoted here. Having barely settled the founding of the congregation, the first group of handmaids began to fulfill their mission with enthusiasm. Three desires become reality. Little by little, new horizons were being opened. The foundresses were completely convinced of the seriousness and importance of the project in which they were engaged. Carried along by their strong apostolic spirit, they wanted to give responses and rapid solutions to the present calamitous times, and for that reason made haste to open new schools. In the first years, in practically all the new foundations, a school and a community were established at the same time. The initial difficulties of facilities and personnel were resolved by work and through confidence in God, the idea that motivated the first handmaids was greater than any problems that would arise. The testimonies about the beginnings of the apostolic activities related to education in the Institute are many and rich in their details. In various foundations the descriptions of poverty, that of the facilities and materials as well as the poverty of the students who used them, are almost overwhelming. The opening of the first classroom of the Madrid community in 1878 offers us one of the most realistic descriptions. A formal class for the girls was begun, the flooring was of thick and irregular pebbles, the walls unfinished, the windows blackened and covered with spider webs, some benches of a quarter or half a yard in length which the girls themselves brought to sit on. To this class came 20 or more girls in rags in dire poverty. The second foundation of the Institute was that of Cordoba 1880. If in Madrid it was an old stable that was repurposed as the location of the first classes of the school, now, because of lack of any other space, the girls would be taught in a nave of the Church of San Juan de los Caballeros, which had recently been given to the handmaids by the Bishop of Cordoba. The foundation of Jerez de la Frontera 1883 faced no fewer difficulties. Mother Pillar was in charge of this community. Here we can affirm with certainty that, more than anything, the spiritual good of one's neighbor was what was sought. In this city there was a significant Protestant presence, and a greater urgency to begin classes was felt. The sisters saw that the population was very simple and needed a great deal of formation. 
they saw up close the possible risk of peoples being influenced by a type of teaching very different from that which they desired to offer. Born along by their apostolic concern, they were not deterred by any kind of difficulties. They agreed to occupy, right away, the same house that had served as housing for the secular teachers a house that was tiny, ugly, poor, at the end of Porvenir Street, which was on the outskirts of the town, the girls in the street were at risk of being led to the Protestants, who had a school very close to that house. It is also worthwhile to mention the beginnings of the school of Zaragoza 1885. We had no space, and we put the school in the cellar. Two years later, when the community moved to a new house, the religious themselves transformed into construction workers labored in order to not have to suspend classes. Our beloved Mother Superior, who has such zeal for souls, could not abide our not offering free classes. She was the first who undertook the work, and it was heartrending to see her exhaust herself so although it encouraged us and filled us with fervor. We put up the walls, and the workers the doors and gutters. I would like to be able to open school by the start of the month. A first glance at our world, at the end of the 19th century, and the beginning of the 20th, drew us to reparation of the poorest girls, but soon another urgent need cried out, the need for a solidly Christian education for the privileged classes, a need already mentioned in the 1886 constitutions and very clearly expressed in the constitutions of 1894, in these terms. It is also the proper work of our institute to provide the same benefits to girls of well-off families, because of the greater good that such girls can offer to society. Seen from this perspective, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is by no means uninterested in the work of academies, and therefore his handmaids must also take care to never view them with indifference. Very quickly, they broadened their horizons, opened new schools, and began to found their first academies. The sisters' profound conviction of the importance and significance of education as an efficacious means to influence society prompted them to found the academies. These academies presented very serious difficulties at first, since it was not easy to coordinate both prayer and teaching, with the scarcity of trained personnel and the premature death of many sisters. We can affirm, based on all the extant documentation, that the academies were a work that was very dear to Mother Pillar, and the result of her efforts. The first academy to be opened was that of La Coruna 1888. We will not delve into the problematic creation and development of this new project. What is certain is that in this foundation, just as in the previous ones, the only goal was to bring the good news of salvation to everyone. They set out on an adventure for which they had little preparation. In the face of the great difficulties that kept arising, Mother Pillar showed even greater enthusiasm. This foundation seems to offer a great future, given that it keeps presenting us with so many problems. She adds in its favor that the city is cold, indifferent, and somewhat worldly, and that the population lacks a good religious formation. She is willing to overcome, against all odds, any difficulties that come her way. Neither here nor in the vicinity is there any education offered by religious, but rather city schools. My judgment is that unless we offer both a day academy and a poor school, which is the goal, we should leave. And it breaks my heart to not be able to remedy this need, for I think that if St. Ignatius were to be alive today and come here, and understand the great needs here, above all other deliberations, seeing their hunger for education, he would bring priests here even though there would be no hope of usefulness to the society, simply for the honor and glory of God and the good of souls, even if that should mean taking them away from places that brought the society all its success. In the foundation of La Coruña, the handmaids had to forego the education of poor girls. The academy required a great deal of attention, and the sisters who worked in it had little preparation. In fact, in 1899 it was necessary to shut it down, for a number of reasons, but on the 31st of October the community was already in Salamanca in order to open a new school the following month. Also particularly interesting is the foundation of the Academy of Cadiz 1894. It would be one of the first works that Mother Pillar carried out as Superior General. Although even here there were difficulties in the beginning, it became the benchmark for the organization of other academies that would come along later. In the beginning, the academies were aimed at the education of the well-to-do, but quite soon the decision was made to attend to the needs of the middle class, who could not afford the cost of a boarding school. This social class is one that was excluded in practice from education. In order to meet this need, after considering the information at hand, they accepted day students, and the emphasis on boarding was decreased. 
It is worth noting that the apostolic vitality of the Institute was marked, from the very beginning, by that strong desire for universality that Mother Sacred Heart always displayed and wanted to include from the start of initial formation. O oh, Mother, instill the spirit of universality deeply into the novices and the tertians. Make them understand that to extend the glory of the Institute it is necessary to become in as far as it does no harm all things to all nations, forgetting completely likes and dislikes but rather seeing everything in God and in God's glory. If we do not do this, nothing we do will be worth even two bits. They always found their strength in the Eucharist. The daily exposition of the Blessed Sacrament save for a very few specific circumstances was extended throughout the better part of the day. That Eucharistic spirit lived deeply launched the sisters toward their apostolic action, and was without a doubt the factor that caused these small seeds, sometimes planted with suffering and sacrifice, to flower and soon bring forth branches full of fruit. 4. Sisters' Preparation When we consider the first years of the educational effort of the Institute, there is an interesting fact that attracts our attention. Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar did not know precisely how an educational center should be run, since their own human, religious, and cultural formation was received in their own home from various tutors. Nevertheless, in the very first approved statutes, as we have seen, the work of education is established as part of the active apostolate. Educational policy in Spain at this time was favorable to the creation of new educational centers, Although it is true that the restoration of the monarchy in 1875 had a more restrictive policy than the Moyana law valid up to 1874, the first handmaids enjoy ample freedom to organize their educational works. Given that they asked for no remuneration, they were not required to follow an official plan of studies, nor would it have occurred to the families of the girls to demand one. The sisters never forgot the objective that had inspired them from the first moment, to do away with ignorance above all religious ignorance of the educated. They claimed that this ignorance was one of the chief causes of societal evils. This idea was already in place, as we have seen, from the time of the Holy Cross convent, where they opened themselves to God with total self-abandon, and He unveiled His plan in them without resorting to human instruments. We owe the first document on education to Mother Maria de los Santos Martes, secretary to Mother Sacred Heart in 1885, we will study this writing in greater detail later, but suffice it to say that it would set the standard for many later developments in the area of education. The document provides us with a rich understanding of what this apostolate meant for those first handmaids. The substance and the object of this teaching is to teach knowledge of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, in order to make Him loved, served, and imitated. Not surprisingly, the cultural and technical preparation for religious who dedicated themselves to teaching was, at that time, very little. The majority did not have degrees, and the Spanish educational laws of the time were lenient in this respect. Few were the sisters who worked directly within each academy or school, although they felt the support of the entire community, which took on education as the apostolate of the community as a whole. At that time, there was no formal plan for training them as teachers, but they attempted to carry out their work diligently. They knew that the task entrusted to them was the work of God and of the institute that God had desired to found. We have a very interesting letter from Mother Sacred Heart to the purist Father Manuel Perez, written during the application process for the approbation of the Institute. Education is in no way for us a secondary pursuit, to such a degree that in order to provide the best possible education we have sisters who are certified and experienced teachers, and these sisters are teaching other sisters who demonstrate greater aptitude. Mothers Claudia and Redencion are becoming very good teachers, but little by little. These days I have them studying the entire day, and the same for all the rest. It would be accurate to say that they have no vacation, and they are so pleased, given their desire to be very useful. To the degree that our educational works became more complex, the need arose for greater preparation and dedication on the part of the sisters. In the letters of those times, we find frequent allusions to the sisters who are dedicated to teaching. The personnel I have are not that of an academy, and what would be best would be that those who are thought to have the capacity for work in the academy study while in the novitiate, and thus things would be much easier. Mother, I tell you from the heart that if we desire to have academies, it would be advisable that there be a person assigned to form the personnel for them. The first handmaids were convinced of the importance and significance of the work given them, and they showed concern for their own spiritual life, which makes the teaching ministry more effective, 
transforming it into apostolic action. Those who will be in the academies need to have a good spirit. In the letters we see how, among the first handmaids, some truly excellent educators emerge, such as in the case of Mother Maria de San Luis, who earned the complete confidence of the foundresses in all things educational. Education was so dear to Mother Pillar's heart that she tried to overcome all the difficulties that came along in the educational works. Pillar earnestly encourages Mother Maria del Carmen when she wonders if perhaps God may not want the academies, given all the problems they present. It may well be that God does not will them, but problems in and of themselves are not a sign of God's disapproval. We have the family as proof of that. It emerged from the most devastating of difficulties, and for every vein of life flowing into us from the wounded heart of our Lord, it seems that a devastating earthquake has to happen first. So much so, and this it is what puzzles me the most, that adversity comes in order that we not give up. Mother Pillar and Mother Sacred Heart suffered, because they could not manage to undertake all that they wanted to accomplish. Obstacles often thwarted their desires. The first handmaids who were dedicated to education had good intuitions in many aspects of pedagogy and formation, intuitions that would be compiled into various regulations. Academies and schools, without distinction, were being organized as well as possible. I am all for educating in the best way we can, from our hearts, keeping in mind the glory of God. Let us not seek, in our poor efforts, the most spectacular, but rather expect modest results completed well, indeed less, but well done. The constitutions called for a list of very concrete qualities in those who would head up the works of education. The prominent role they enjoy might surprise us today. Mother Pillar intervened very directly in the organization of the School of Cordoba, the second of the congregation. Probably, her enthusiasm for educational works, which grew in her as the years went by, stemmed from this experience. It was she who decided that the curriculum should be based on Christian doctrine, literacy, and some training in home economics. She had to concentrate on the most urgent needs, given that the students would not stay in school for long. The setup of the school in Jerez de la Frontera was quite similar. Bilbo also had a well-adapted educational approach. Among the academies, the one in Cadiz stands out for its good organization, formation, and teaching. From the beginning, the congregation sought to provide a high caliber of education together with the religious formation offered. The first handmade educators were very aware of the fact that a true education must integrate all the dimensions of the human person. The defining characteristic of our education should be its solidity, solid piety, solid learning, and so that the fruits of their piety may also be solid, we will help them understand that true virtue consists in each person carrying out well the duties of her particular state, and that any piety not based in this principle is vain, dangerous, and a fleeting illusion. As the educational works of the Institute grew stronger, they enjoyed an ever better reputation in society. 5. Other Apostolates Related to Education Catechesis This apostolate was carried out from the very beginning of the Institute. Having barely arrived in Madrid, the sisters occupied themselves in ensuring that the poor girls of the Cuatro Caminos neighborhood, and later the girls of Chambery, began the catechesis necessary to receive the sacraments of penance and communion. Our sisters had made it known that they received girls desiring to be taught the catechism, and even when the house was out of the way, the poor things came quite a distance every afternoon in order to receive instruction. In one of the first documents in the congregation's history, Mother Sacred Heart writes to His Holiness, Pope Leo Roman XIII, with these words. These humble daughters in Jesus Christ do not aspire to anything in this world beyond adoring our divine, sacramental Lord, to consecrate ourselves to Him forever, to teach poor girls Christian doctrine. It is important to note that in Spain at this time, religious ignorance in the economically disadvantaged classes was very great, and for that reason, the work of catechesis, within and outside formal education, and extended to all ages, was something that the first handmaids always had in mind. Faith formation, throughout the history of the Institute, has always been one of our fundamental apostolic tasks. Sunday School the constitutions of 1894 indicate the superior's responsibility to students thus. She will treat them with maternal providence, ensuring that they do not drift apart from us and from our houses, and where possible, dedicating some time on the afternoons of days off to gather them, instruct them, and protect them. Doubtless, here we see the beginning of the Sunday schools, 
that have had such a long tradition in the history of the Institute for many years. It was mainly our former students who attended these schools. In 1883, the Sunday School of Jerez had already begun to function. In some Sunday schools, classes in typing, shorthand, accounting, languages, and sewing were given. There were also celebrations and time for recreation. Spiritual formation had an important place as well. Often there were talks and retreats for the young women. The Sunday School of Bilbao is worth mentioning because of its importance. A great woman, Rafaela de Ibera, played a crucial role in the creation and development of this program. Later on, she would found the Institute of the Sisters of Guardian Angels. She suggested to Mother Sacred Heart that she open some Sunday schools for dressmakers and seamstresses whose guild is quite neglected and who have no place to shelter themselves on their days off from the many inducements the world offers them, attracting them to sin. This apostolate was carried out selflessly and with great sacrifice for many years in almost all the houses of Spain that had Sunday schools. Night schools. The information we have about this apostolate is vague, but by 1896, we know that night schools began to function. If sustaining schools and academies was difficult in the beginning, we can only imagine the sacrifice and effort required to maintain these night schools. In most cases, they were unable to achieve much academically, but we do have records of many students who frequented the night schools and, thanks to them, were able to radically change their way of life. 6. Our Foundresses In this first part, we have been able to see that education belongs in the core identity of the Institute. From the first moments of our existence, the foundresses and the first handmaids intuited and developed the creative depth of our charism in the field of education. They sought ways to help and strove to respond to the great challenges in Spanish society, despite seemingly insurmountable difficulties. They were inspired by just one ideal, that Christ should be known and loved by the greatest number possible, thereby achieving a consequent improvement of society. We cannot doubt for an instant that both Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar, each in her own way and through the unique role that God gave her, loved the world of education deeply. Mother Pillar endeavored tirelessly to carry the work of the academies forward. We must necessarily cite part of that precious letter that she wrote to Mother Presentacion Arela, Prefect of the Academy of Cadiz, a letter that our sister Inmaculada Inez quite rightly considers the Magna Carta of our apostolate of education. In the letter, along with lamenting the loss to the congregation that the closing of academies would entail a move promoted by the assistants general because of the need to give greater care to the worship of the blessed sacrament, she writes, It pleases me so much to receive a letter from you, and if I could, to be able to write you and all the academies more often, because when I see how they value them, it inspires me to instill in you the desire to sacrifice even your lives for the education of youth. Truly, Tiche was the distinct characteristic of the life of our Lord, because even in his hidden life, we are told that its goal was to make him available as an example for us, since he did not have to strive for availability to God for this holy mission of teaching. And I can't put into words how my desire for teaching keeps growing. And when the Institute has more personnel, you'll see how the academies will beautifully elevate the worship of the blessed sacrament, because it will be alternating both goals, bringing to the throne the exhaustion and the compassion we feel for our little angels, and later, bringing to our classes and the care we show to the girls all the blessings and lights received in the royal audience. When she was no longer the general of the institute and had retired to Valladolid as the grain that must die, she continued to dream of the good that education could bring about. Now that we have the terrain, we have to beg God to help us to construct a great building with all the necessary facilities that he may receive great glory in our educating holy and useful women who will sanctify society. Mother Sacred Heart demonstrated a preference for the free schools, but did not exclude the academies from her care, because it is also the proper concern of our institute to promote the same good for girls from well-off families. We do not possess very many of her writings on education, but thanks to a letter from Mother Maria de los Santos Martes to Mother Pillar, we know something of Mother Sacred Heart's opinion about academies. Your letter gave me such consolation and consoled Mother Sacred Heart as well, how much it speaks to me about the academies. I have read it to everyone so that they know what the first ones think and how the ministry gives great glory to God. I will keep this letter as though it were a relic. 
Sister Mercedes Lezhano, who lived with St. Raffaela for eight years, was one of the last handmaids who knew her personally. She wrote down some of the memories that she had of the saint with the desire of passing them on, since she considered it a great favor of God that she had been able to know her well. In November 1924, we opened the house of Siampino. Before going to our new assignments, we went to bid her farewell. She was at that point already quite ill, but when she saw a group of young handmaids gathered around her bed, she told us, you are going to open the first academy in Italy. Work with zeal and ardor to form the girls that the Lord entrusts to your care. It was the last time I saw her. Two months later, she went to heaven. These words, spoken in almost her last days, confirm once again her love for education. It was her role, for a long period, to have no involvement other than to consider the work carried out by other sisters to be her own. She felt that she ministered with them and among them and maintained the most careful and prudent interest in all the apostolic works that were coming into being. However, it was necessary to lay firm foundations, and both she and her sister allowed themselves to be tamped down in order to construct the solid new building. Chapter Roman II, Development of Our Educational Activity 1903-1932 1. Rapid Growth 1903-1932 Immediately, the grain of wheat began to bear fruit, to yield an abundant harvest, the building was being constructed quickly. God all faithful was accompanying the work that had been begun against all hope. God is much greater than his poor creatures. Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar knew that now their role in the Institute was quite different. In the midst of heartache and suffering, they continued to trust blindly in that Father who had guided them with such love by pathways so different throughout the years. Now that their lives had converged, they had more clarity than ever about what God was asking of them. We must be the most generous, the most detached, and the first to cooperate in everything that will benefit the Institute, promoting its honor and consolidation in every way we can, and now with much more merit than before, because we do it stripped bare of any natural interest, but only for pure love of God. Let us become saints, and no one will do more for the Institute than we. Today, neither you nor I have an obligation to the congregation beyond praying for it and fulfilling well our constitutions and rules. God will demand of us a careful account of these duties, not of any other burdens and responsibilities that we might like to add on, but which are not our proper role now. The year after her resignation as general, Mother Pillar wrote the following during her spiritual exercises. I seem to have discovered with clarity that the grain must die in order to give the Institute much fruit. The two sisters were the solid foundations of the young congregation. From May 11, 1903 until March 7, 1933, Mother Purissima was the superior general of the Institute. The congregation experienced much growth during those years, 